6.2 Classical Conditioning Learning Objectives By the end of this section, you'll be able to explain how classical conditioning occurs and summarize the processes of acquisition, extinction, spontaneous recovery, generalization, and discrimination. Does the name Ivan Pavlov ring a bell? Even if you're new to the study of psychology, chances are that you've heard of Pavlov and his famous dogs. Pavlov, a Russian scientist, performed extensive research on dogs and is best known for his experiments in classical conditioning. As we discussed briefly in the previous section, classical conditioning is a process by which we learn to associate stimuli and, consequently, to anticipate events. Pavlov came to his conclusions about how learning occurs completely by accident. Pavlov was a physiologist, not a psychologist. Physiologists study the life processes of organisms, from the molecular level to the level of cells, organ systems, and entire organisms. Pavlov's area of interest was the digestive system. In his studies with dogs, Pavlov surgically implanted tubes inside dogs' cheeks to collect saliva. He then measured the amount of saliva produced in response to various foods. Over time, Pavlov observed that the dogs began to salivate not only at the taste of food, but also at the sight of food, and at the sight of an empty bowl, and even at the sound of the laboratory assistant's footsteps. Salivating to food in the mouth is reflexive, so no learning is involved. However, dogs don't naturally salivate at the sight of an empty bowl or the sound of footsteps. These unusual responses intrigued Pavlov, and he wondered what accounted for what he called the dog's psychic secretions. To explore this phenomenon in an objective manner, Pavlov designed a series of carefully controlled experiments to see which stimuli would cause the dogs to salivate. He was able to train the dogs to salivate in response to stimuli that clearly had nothing to do with food, such as the sound of a bell, a light, and a touch on the leg. Through his experiments, Pavlov realized that an organism has two types of responses to its environment. One, unconditioned or unlearned responses or reflexes, and two, conditioned or learned responses. In Pavlov's experiments, the dogs salivated each time meat powder was presented to them. The meat powder in this situation was an unconditioned stimulus, or UCS a stimulus that elicits a reflexive response in an organism. The dog's salivation was an unconditioned response, or UCR, a natural or unlearned reaction to a given stimulus. Before conditioning, think of the dog's stimulus and response like this. Meat powder, the unconditioned stimulus, results in salivation, the unconditioned response. In classical conditioning, a neutral stimulus is presented immediately before an unconditioned stimulus. Pavlov would sound a tone, like ringing a bell, and then give the dogs the meat powder. The tone was the neutral stimulus, or the NS, which is a stimulus that does not naturally elicit response. Prior to conditioning, the dogs did not salivate when they just heard the tone because the tone had no association for the dogs. Quite simply, this pairing means tone, neutral stimulus, plus meat powder, the unconditioned stimulus, leads to salivation, or unconditioned response. When Pavlov paired the tone with the meat powder over and over again, the previously neutral stimulus, the tone, also began to elicit salivation from the dogs. Thus, the neutral stimulus became the conditioned stimulus, the CS which is a stimulus that elicits a response after repeatedly being paired with an unconditioned stimulus. Eventually, the dogs began to salivate to the tone alone, just as they previously had salivated at the sound of the assistant's footsteps. The behavior caused by the conditioned stimulus is called the conditioned response, or CR. In the case of Pavlov's dogs, they had learned to associate the tone, CS, with being fed, and they began to salivate, CR, in anticipation of the food. Real-world application of classical conditioning. 
How does classical conditioning work in the real world? Let's say you have a cat named Tiger who's quite spoiled. You keep her food in a separate cabinet and you also have a special electric can opener that you use only to open cans of cat food. For every meal, Tiger hears the distinctive sound of the electric can opener, zzz, 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 and then gets her food. Tiger quickly learns that when she hears zzz, 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 she's about to get fed. What do you think Tiger does when she hears the electric can opener? She'll likely get excited and run to where you're preparing her food. This is an example of classical conditioning. In this case, you should think about what are the UCS, the CS, the UCR, and the CR? What if the cabinet holding Tiger's food becomes squeaky? In that case, Tiger hears squeak, the cabinet, followed by zzz, 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 the electric can opener, and then she gets her food. Tiger will learn that to get excited when she hears the squeak of the cabinet. Pairing a new neutral stimulus, the squeak, with the conditioned stimulus, zh, 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 is called higher order conditioning or second order conditioning. This means that you're using the conditioned stimulus of the can opener to condition another stimulus, the squeaky cabinet. It's hard to achieve anything above second order conditioning. For example, if you ring a bell, open the cabinet, squeak, use the can opener, and then feed Tiger, Tiger will likely never get excited when hearing the bell alone. Everyday Connection Classical Conditioning at Stingray City Kate and her husband Scott recently vacationed in the Cayman Islands and booked a boat tour to Stingray City where they could feed and swim with the southern stingrays. The boat captain explained how the normally solitary stingrays had become accustomed to interacting with humans. About 40 years ago, fishermen began to clean fish and conch, which were the unconditioned stimulus, at a particular sandbar near a barrier reef, and large numbers of stingrays would swim in to eat, the unconditioned response, what the fishermen threw into the water. This continued for years. By the late 1980s, word of the large group of stingrays spread among scuba divers, who then started feeding them by hand. Over time, the southern stingrays in the area were classically conditioned much like Pavlov's dogs. When they hear the sound of a boat engine, the previously neutral stimulus that becomes a conditioned stimulus, they know that they're going to get to eat the conditioned response. As soon as Kate and Scott reached Stingray City, over two dozen stingrays surrounded their tour boat. The couple slipped into the water with bags of squid, the stingrays' favorite treat. The swarm of stingrays bumped and rubbed against their legs like hungry cats. Kate and Scott were able to feed, pet, and even kiss, for luck, these amazing creatures. Then all the squid was gone, and so were the stingrays. Classical conditioning also applies to humans, even babies. For example, Sarah buys formula in blue canisters for her six-month-old daughter, Angelina. Whenever Sarah takes out the formula container, Angelina gets excited and tries to reach toward the food and most likely salivates. Why does Angelina get excited when she sees the formula canisters? Again, what are the unconditioned stimulus, the conditioned stimulus, the unconditioned response, and the conditioned response here? So far, all of the examples have involved food but classical conditioning extends beyond the basic need to be fed. Consider our earlier example of a dog whose owners install an invisible electric dog fence. A small electrical shock, the unconditioned stimulus, elicits discomfort, unconditioned response. When the unconditioned stimulus, the shock, is paired with a neutral stimulus, the edge of the yard, the dog associates the discomfort or the unconditioned response with the edge of the yard, the conditioned stimulus, and then stays in the boundaries. In this example, the edge of the yard elicits fear and anxiety in the dog. So fear and anxiety are the conditioned response. General processes in classical conditioning. Now that you know how classical conditioning works and have seen several examples, let's take a look at some of the general processes involved. <laughs> 
In classical conditioning, the initial period of learning is known as acquisition, when an organism learns to connect a neutral stimulus and an unconditioned stimulus. During acquisition, the neutral stimu stimulus begins to elicit the conditioned response, and eventually the neutral stimulus becomes a conditioned stimulus capable of eliciting the conditioned response by itself. Timing is important for conditioning to occur. Typically, there should only be a brief interval between presentation of the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus. Depending on what is being conditioned, sometimes this interval is as little as five seconds. However, with other types of conditioning, the interval can be up to several hours. Taste aversion is a type of conditioning in which an interval of several hours may pass between the conditioned stimulus, whatever was ingested, and the unconditioned stimulus, the nausea or illness. Here's how it works. Between classes, you and a friend grab a quick lunch from a food cart on campus. You share a dish of chicken curry and you head off to your next class. A few hours later, you feel nauseous and become ill. Although your friend is fine and you determine that you have intestinal flu, that the food is not the culprit, you've developed a taste aversion. The next time you're at a restaurant and someone orders curry, you immediately feel ill. While the chicken dish is not what made you sick, you are experiencing taste aversion. You've been conditioned to be averse to a food after a single negative experience. How does this occur? Conditioning based on a single instance and involving an extended time lapse between the event and the negative stimulus. Research into taste aversion suggests that this response may be an evolutionary ad adaptation designed to help organisms quickly learn to avoid harmful foods. Not only may this contribute to species survival via natural selection, but it may also help us develop strategies for challenges such as helping cancer patients through the nausea induced by certain treatments. Once we've established the connection between the unconditioned stimulus and the conditioned stimulus, how do we break that connection? and get the dog, cat, or child to stop responding. In Tiger's case, imagine what would happen if you stopped using the electric can opener for her food and began to use it only for human food. Now Tiger would hear the can opener, but she wouldn't get food. In classical conditioning terms, you would be giving the conditioned stimulus, but not the unconditioned stimulus. Pavlov explored this scenario in his experiments with dogs sounding the tone without giving the dogs the meat powder. Soon the dog stopped responding to the tone. Extinction is the decrease in the conditioned response when the unconditioned stimulus is no longer presented with the condi conditioned stimulus. When presented with the conditioned stimulus alone, the dog, cat, or other organism would show a weaker and weaker response. And finally, no response. In classical conditioning terms, there's a gradual weakening and disappearance of the conditioned response. What happens when learning is not used for a while, when what was learned lies dormant? As we just discussed, Pavlov found that when he repeatedly presented the bell, the conditioned stimulus, without the meat powder, the unconditioned stimulus, extinction occurred. The dog stopped salivating to the bell. However, after a couple of hours of resting from this extinction training, the dogs again began to salivate when Pavlov rang the bell. What do you think would happen if Tiger's behavior, if your electric can opener broke and you didn't use it for several months? When you finally got it fixed and started using it to open Tiger's food again, Tiger would remember the association between the can opener and her food. She would get excited and run to the kitchen when she heard the sound. The behavior of Pavlov's dogs and tiger illustrates a concept Pavlov called spontaneous recovery, the return of a previously extinguished conditioned response following a rest period. Of course, these processes also apply in humans. For example, let's say that every day when you walk to campus, an ice cream truck passes your route. Day after day, you hear the truck's music, the neutral stimulus. So you finally stop and purchase a chocolate ice cream bar. You take a bite, the unconditioned stimulus, and then your mouth waters, the unconditioned response. This initial period of learning is known as acquisition, 
when you begin to connect the neutral stimulus, the sound of the truck, and the unconditioned stimulus, the taste of the chocolate ice cream in your mouth. During acquisition, the conditioned response gets stronger and stronger through repeated pairings of the combined stimulus and unconditioned stimulus. Several days, and ice cream bars later, you notice that your mouth begins to water, the conditioned response, as soon as you hear the truck's musical jingle, even before you bite into the ice cream bar. Then, one day you head down the street. You hear the truck's music, the conditioned stimulus, and your mouth waters, the conditioned response. However, when you get to the truck, you discover that they're all out of ice cream. You leave disappointed. The next few days, you pass by the truck and hear the music, but you don't stop to get an ice cream bar because you're running late for class. You begin to salivate less and less when you hear the music, until, by the end of the week, your mouth no longer waters when you hear the tune. This illustrates extinction. The conditioned response weakens when only the conditioned stimulus, the sound of the truck, is presented, without then being followed by the unconditioned stimulus, the chocolate ice cream. Then the weekend comes. You don't have to go to class, so you don't pass the truck. Monday morning arrives and you take your usual route to campus. You round the corner and hear the truck again. What do you think happens? Your mouth begins to water again. Why? Well, after a break from conditioning, the conditioned response reappears, which indicates spontaneous recovery. Acquisition and extinction involve the strengthening and weakening, respectively, of a learned association. Two other learning processes, stimulus discrimination and stimulus generalization, are involved in distinguishing which stimuli will trigger the learned association. Animals, including humans, need to distinguish between stimuli, for example, between sounds that predict a threatening event and sounds that do not, so that they can respond appropriately such as running away if the sound is threatening. When an organism learns to respond differently to various stimuli that are similar, it's called stimulus discrimination. In classical conditioning terms, the organism demonstrates the conditioned response only to the conditioned stimulus. Pavlov's dogs discriminated between the basic tone that sounded before they were fed and other tones, such as the doorbell, because other sounds did not predict the arrival of food. Similarly, Tiger, the cat, discriminated between the sound of the can opener and the sound of the electric mixer. When the electric mixer is going, Tiger's not about to get fed, so she doesn't come running to the kitchen looking for food. On the other hand, when an organism de demonstrates the condition response to stimuli that are similar to the conditioned stimulus, it's called stimulus generalization the opposite of stimulus discrimination. The more similar the stimulus is to the conditioned stimulus, the more likely the organism is to give the conditioned response. For instance, if the electric mixer sounds very similar to the electric can opener, Tiger may come running after hearing it sound. But if you don't feed her following the electric mixer sound, and you continue to feed her consistently after the electric can opener sound, she'll quickly learn to discriminate between the two sounds, provided they're sufficiently dissimilar that she can tell them apart. Sometimes classical conditioning can lead to habituation. Habituation occurs when we learn not to respond to a stimulus that is presented repeatedly without change. As the stimulus occurs over and over, we learn not to focus our attention on it. For example, Imagine that your neighbor or roommate is constantly having the television blaring. This background noise is distracting and makes it difficult for you to focus when you're studying. However, over time, you become accustomed to the stimulus of the television noise, and eventually, you hardly notice it any longer. Behaviorism. John B. Watson, as shown in figure 6.8, is considered the founder of behaviorism. Behaviorism is a school of thought that arose during the first part of the 20th century, which incorporates elements of Pavlov's classical conditioning. In stark contrast with Freud, who considered the reasons for behavior to be hidden in the unconscious, Watson championed the idea that all behavior can be studied as a simple stimulus-response reaction, 
without regard for internal processes. Watson argued that in order for psychology to become a legitimate science, it must shift its concern away from internal mental processes because mental processes can't be seen or measured. Instead, he asserted that psychology must focus on outward observable behavior that can be measured. Watson's ideas were influenced by Pavlov's work. According to Watson, human behavior, just like animal behavior, is primarily the result of conditioned responses. Whereas Pavlov's work with dogs involved the conditioning of reflexes, Watson believed the same principles could be extended to the conditioning of human emotions. Thus began Watson's work with his graduate student, Rosalie Rayner, and a baby called Little Albert. Through their experiments with Little Albert, Watson and Rayner demonstrated how fears can be conditioned. In 1920, Watson was the chair of the psychology department at Johns Hopkins University. Through his position at the university, he came to meet little Albert's mother, Arvilla Marite, who worked at a campus hospital. Watson offered her a dollar to allow her son to be the subject of his experiments in classical conditioning. Through these experiments, little Albert was exposed to and conditioned to fear certain things. Initially, he was presented with various neutral stimuli, including a rabbit, a dog, a monkey, masks, cotton wool, and a white rat. He wasn't afraid of any of these things. Then, Watson, with the help of Rayner, conditioned little Albert to associate these stimuli with an emotion, fear. For example, Watson handed little Albert the white rat, and little Albert enjoyed playing with it. Then Watson made a loud sound by striking a hammer against a metal bar hanging behind little Albert's head each time little Albert touched the rat. Little Albert was frightened by the sound, demonstrating a reflexive fear of sudden loud noises, and began to cry. Watson repeatedly paired the loud sound with the white rat. Soon, little Albert became frightened by the white rat alone. Days later, little Albert demonstrated stimulus generalization. He became afraid of other furry things, a rabbit, a furry coat, and even a Santa Claus mask. Watson had succeeded in conditioning a fear response in little Albert, thus demonstrating that emotions could become conditioned responses. It had been Watson's intention to produce a phobia, a persistent excessive fear of a specific object or situation, through conditioning alone, thus countering Freud's view that phobias are caused by deep hidden conflicts in the mind. However, there's no evidence that little Albert experienced phobias in later years. Little Albert's mother moved away, ending the experiment. While Watson's research provided new insight into conditioning, it would be considered unethical by today's standards. Everyday Connection Advertising and Associative Learning Advertising executives are pros at applying the principles of associative learning. Think about the car commercials you've seen on TV. Many of them feature an attractive model. By associating the model with the car being advertised, you come to see the car as being desirable. You may be asking yourself, does this advertising technique actually work? Well, according to Cialdini, men who viewed a car commercial that included an attractive model later rated the car as being faster, more appealing, and better designed than did men who saw the advertisement for the same car minus the model. Have you ever noticed how quickly advertisers cancel contracts with a famous athlete following a scandal? As far as the advertiser is concerned, that athlete is no longer associated with positive feelings. Therefore, the athlete cannot be used as an unconditioned stimulus to condition the public to associate positive feelings, the unconditioned response, with their product, the conditioned stimulus. Now that you're aware of how associative learning works, See if you can find some examples of these types of advertisements on TV, in magazines, or on the internet.